Welcome back to the Life at the Academy podcast. In this episode, then midshipman Nels Waranimi interviews retired Captain John Fryman. Captain Fryman is a permanent military professor of history at the U.S. Naval Academy. After spending the first half of his career as a surface warfare officer, he earned his Ph.D. in the history of Christianity from the University of Chicago before becoming a naval educator. He's the co-author of the book Developing the Naval Mind. Keep listening to hear Captain Fryman discuss his career, including stories of his time as a speechwriter at the Pentagon, plus his unique perspective on Naval Academy life. The interview begins with his response to the question, does the Naval Academy transform people? The topic was uh, that Nels brought up was, does the Naval Academy transform people? And wh- who's the author that you mentioned? Yuvalovin. Yuvalovin. And so my reply is that I think, as, a, as someone who hasn't gone here but has been deeply engaged and committed to the mission and loved it, I've loved teaching midshipmen. Um, I think for some people it does and others not so much. Um, and frankly, right, others kick against it. And maybe later on they'll say, yeah, it did change me in a way, and they look back on it, and they might say, yeah, I look back on that, and it, it did shape me. I don't know if it transformed me. Frankly, one of my mentors, Admiral J. Paul Reason, class of 65, um, I asked him once. I used to be a speechwriter at Sink, uh, when he was Sinkland Fleet. And I said, early in my teaching career here, I said, do you know, do you think that um, you're a good officer because of the Naval Academy? And this was at a family dinner. And he paused and said, no, I think I'm a better officer because I went to the Naval Academy. Now, you know, he, his time here would not exactly be characterized as fun. Class of 65, a black man in the class of 65, Vietnam era, civil rights era. He and his bride did not exactly have an easy time of it. <laughs> um, but, you know, his son has uh, came here, and now his uh, grandson... Uh, is starting right now. He's in his second week with plebe summer, the third JP reason to come through the doors of this place. You know, so it's certainly had an impact on their family, you know. I think it can be transformative depending on how much you love it, you let it in, how you respond to it. Some mids never let it in. Some mids, like John McCain, kick like hell against it, um, but then later look back on the institution as some, their time at the institution as something they value. And they, but you'll, you'll hear different people take different things out of it. What did you love about it? Well, I really love my classmates. I love the bond we formed. Um, some might talk about the education, but frankly, I don't, I don't really hear a lot of that. I don't. I, I mean, I think it's a great education, but if, if you managed to get one, <laughs> um, just because you have a degree doesn't mean you had an education, right? But, yeah, I think it has been transformative for some of the mids I've seen. Sir, we asked this question to Dr. Simons, who just finished writing a book about Chester Nimitz. And his answer was that Chester Nimitz came to the Naval Academy with sound character and with a unique temperament. We also asked this question of uh, Rear Admiral Cox, who's the director of Naval History and Heritage Command, and he said, I love the education, but I came to the Naval Academy with my character already intact. So does the Naval Academy develop character from your experience, sir? Wow. Well, so I would agree with uh, Professor Simons and Admiral Cox wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I mean, by the time you get here, you've grown up in a certain environment. And, and the Naval Academy 
is probably not going to drastically change the product of 18 years of a certain kind of upbringing. It might refine it. It might challenge it. Um, and, I, you know, I've met mids from all walks of life. I've met mids from the upper crust of society. I've met mids who are the very opposite of what you would call privileged, both white and of color, um, women, men, you know, um, they come here with a certain character already. Well, I, th I think the place may s sharpen parts of that character, dull other parts, um, improve some parts. I don't know, maybe even make some stuff worse. I hope not, but um, I think it tends to make them better, whatever they came here with. But, you know, when they leave here, that's just the beginning, right? I, I mean, I also agree with the statement that the Naval Academy does not really make officers. I know the mission statement to graduate leaders who will be dedicated to a career of naval service. But are you a fully formed officer on commissioning day? You know, does something magical happen when you, Nels, take off those eagles and put on that single gold bar and now all of a sudden you're an officer who's got, who's got it all taken care of? No way in hell, right? I mean, <laughs> your gunny or your senior chief might have strong disagreement with that claim. You know, and I look back on my time in the fleet as a Navy junior, and I, my, I mean, my, my upbringing made me a certain way. Dad certainly kind of raised his eldest son as, as an old school destroyerman would do. But I also look back on, this goes to your mentorship question that you had written down. I also look back on uh, Lieutenant Bill Crow, my first boss. He's class of 80. Bill was a, my, my, I mean, Bill was awesome. He's, my kids call him Uncle Bill. Let's put it that way. Bill's family. I love that guy. <laughs> but he made, he made me a great divo, you, you know, and, but so did my fellow divos. They challenged me. We had each other's back. Um, my senior chief, Frank Lindsay, and my chief, um, um, Chris Brinkman, definitely had a lot to do with my formation uh, as an officer, you know, and further developing my character and my leadership style. Um, but other department heads also contributed to that. You know, I was fortunate in that way. Um, so I think, you know, I, it, it was another officer who I was talking about, a senior officer, because uh, the fleet makes officers. I'll buy that. I hope we give them great material, of course. I think for the most part, we do. We, but we also bring it in. I mean, the admissions office does a pretty good job. <laughs> um, and then we begin that process of development and refinement. Um, it's been a privilege to be a part of that. Well, sir, now that we've started this discussion at a high level about the Naval Academy as an institution, can we take a step back and hear about how you got to the Navy in the first place? Why were you, why were you interested in joining the Navy? Uh, to be blunt, Nels, I wasn't. Um, I grew up a Navy junior. Uh, Dad started as a destroyerman, uh, commissioned out of OCS in 1959. Uh, his first ship was the USS Sutherland. Then he had a lieutenant junior grade command as... Um, the skipper of PTF-1 out of Da Nang in the early 60s, even before the Nasties and Swifts came in, he was operating out of Da Nang. Um, he, he rem where he was when Kennedy was assassinated was on the deck of the PTF-1. For him da to hear Dad talk about it, um, that was his favorite time in the Navy, was the skipper of a gunboat in Vietnam, fast one. Um, I still had the reduction gear that broke during a time when you wouldn't want it to break. You know, and then he was drafted by Admiral Rickover into the nuclear power program. And then he went to USS Truxton. Back then it was called DLGN 35 before it was reclassed as CGN. And that's where he met Admiral Reason, who was a divo at the time, and Dad was the OPSO. And then Dad lateraled into Intel 
because uh, you know it was kind of like today where he, he had really long deployments and really young children and wanted to come home to his family a little more often but you know we moved around a lot as you would expect and uh, but we eventually settled in Hawaii so it's all I knew and I wanted something different I didn't necessarily want to go Navy but dad but then college came around and I'm the oldest of four in the pre-Reagan era well with a dad who spent his entire career basically in the pre-Reagan Navy so commanders in the pre-Reagan Navy didn't really earn much. And we're in Hawaii. And Dad says, apply wherever you want, then we'll have a sit down. So I applied to eight schools. And he said, well, I can afford the U of Hawaii and Iowa State, which were at the kind of the bottom of my list. Oddly enough, U of Hawaii, I mean, you know, it was, I didn't want to go to college at home. So he says, for the rest of you, just, I recommend you contact your Navy recruiter. <laughs> and Dad was very honest. He says, here's how much money I make. Here's what's coming in. Here's what's going out. I'm not bankrupting the family just so you can go to school. So I went ROTC. Four for four seemed like a reasonably good deal. But here I am 34 years after commissioning. <laughs> <laughs> so where do you end up going for your undergrad? I went to the University of Rochester in New York, and I got a BS in optics. And at the time, the ROTC unit, you know, now I was, I, so I went to Rochester in 83. So now we're in the early years of the, of the Reagan era, right, and the Lehman era for the Navy, the 600-ship Navy buildup, you know, um, and the ROTC unit back then was big. We were 10% of the undergraduate student body at 300 plus. Um, you know, Rochester wasn't a huge school and it had a graduate program as well. But uh, yeah, we were a presence on campus. Not like, you know, the core cadets at A&M or anything like that. Um, but it was a great bunch of people to, to be with. Um, yeah, so that's kind of, I did the ROTC thing, you know, it, was, it worked for me. Um, and Rochester was a great school, except for the weather. That's horrible. Um, you know, and I didn't go to school in the summer, so. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> so how did your dad get drafted by Admiral Rickover? <laughs> you know, I don't know all the particulars of that story. There are med there are so many stories about being drafted, you know, and sitting in Admiral Rickover's office and all that. But Dad had an engineering degree, civil eng, had worked in eng civil engineering after college. Um, he went to Iowa State. I don't know how he was drafted, but that he was drafted. He was directed. He was actually learning Turkish. He was hoping to go, I think, um, overseas to Turkey you know, do that military attache thing or something. If, as I recall, it's been so long and, you know, dad died in 2000, so I can't go back to him and ask for clarification. But apparently, the, you know, it's the needs of the Navy. So uh, because of the needs of the Navy, he found himself in Admiral Rickover's office and he was directed to enter the, Navy, <laughs> the nuclear power program. <laughs> And uh, not submarines, though. He, so he, he stayed surface. And I was born. I was born in Idaho Falls, Idaho, because he was there for prototype. So we left when I was six months old. I think they went to Bremerton. So the next time I went, stepped foot in Idaho Falls was 1992, <laughs> when I was on a road trip just to check it out. Okay. It wasn't any, anything to do with your responsibilities in the Navy? No. No. By then, I had actually resigned my ROTC commission. I'd said, well, I completed my time, and I went on a solo road trip around the country to decompress before I started grad school. Um, so that was part of my route was Idaho Falls. Sir, you, you left the Navy after how many years in, as a junior officer? Yeah, four. Okay. Yeah, I did my Divo tour. Um, then wanted something totally different. The Briscoe years, I remember as um, 
they were now those were formative, but I won't call them fun. And that's all I want to say. <laughs> now we remember good stories from those times. You know, I'm in touch with my shipmates, and uh, usually, you know, nowadays it's like, how is it we remember all the good times now, and the bad stuff kind of fades. I'm like, oh, I can call up some of the bad stuff, <laughs> but we just don't want to talk about it, you know. But I just wanted to do something different, yeah. so I stayed reserved. And you stayed reserved. Um, applying to graduate school or, or what were your interests at that time? What were, what were you aiming to do? Man, I was, what, it's 92. How old was I? I was 27, single, didn't really know what I wanted to do, thought I'd try that university life. So I went to Chicago and took a master for a master's in religion, which my father thought I was just, that my head went to mush, you know. He thought I went nuts, but uh, he ur- at his urging, I also affiliated with the reserve in uh, Great Lakes and landed in a good unit there. Uh, they were so their their unit that they were attached to was um, I forget the old op code. I think it was, might have been op 06 or op 60. I forget. Eventually, N five thirteen, the strategy, the strategy and concepts branch, kind of a brain trust shop, I guess. But the great bunch of guys in that reserve unit. It was an all-officer unit except for, um, yeah, I think we had one chief or senior chief. So no enlisted at all, which was weird. Um, But so I did my summers at the Pentagon. So when I'm talking to you about the Pentagon, yeah, I remember commuting on the metro to the Pentagon back when we were required to wear whites. On the entire commute, sir? Yes. We got lucky enough to wear civilian clothes. I would have done that, but I uh, there was the, the the I would have had to go to the locker room in the in the what are the with the POAC? Is that what they called the gym? And it's been a while. But there was really no space to do that in in the office. So I just commuted in whites. Yes, sir. So is that when you were a speechwriter for Admiral Reason? Uh well, no, not by assignment. I picked up a couple assignments when I was so oddly enough, I did write a speech for him once when he was uh, a vice admiral. Uh, this is totally accidental. He was N three five, and I just went out there for a summer, you know, doing my summer active training, and I was at N five thirteen, and then I got this summons to go to the front office, meaning his shop. And I'm thinking, okay, but everyone up the chain was, why does Admiral Reason want to meet with this random reserve lieutenant? Like, what's that about? And, well, I had to explain. It might be because my dad and and he were shipmates. (laughs) So it, it really is just kind of, hey, how's it going kind of encounter but it got a lot of uncomfortable attention (laughs) you know no the admiral's not jumping the chain down you know this is a social call but i did get an assignment to write something for him because the staff was short they were busy with other things and it came to the shop and so you know that speech led to another speech led to another speech led to a job and so that that job came after you earned your phd or no i was all but dissertation and um you know, being a restless guy back then and still single, I was kind of, st- I had finished my doctoral exams, um, and I just wanted to leave the south side of Chicago. I was tired of living there, and I'm like, I need a break. So this reserve gig at Landfleet headquarters opened up. So I worked with, my job was special assistant to Emma Reason, working with him on a, a project that became a Newport paper called Sailing New Seas. Um, my dad was also a co-author on that. It was kind of fun to do that. I mean, I was just the J.O. Act- action officer, ghost writer, do this, do that guy, right? Yes, and uh, But it was, it was fun to do for three months. Actually, a little more than three months. Anyway, at the end of that six-monther, I thought, well, okay, well, that was a nice break from academe, and now I'll go back and do my doctorate. 
I'm done, right? I've had a nice break. That was really cool. Um, now I'll go work on my proposal and I'll go back to school and work on my doctorate. I mean, literally the day before I detached, then Captain uh, Carmen, C-A-R-M-A-N, one of my mentors there and my immediate boss at Landfleet headquarters, called me into his office. And I thought it was just a goodbye thing. And he goes, hey, what are you doing um, when you leave? I said, what do you mean, sir? I'm, I'm, I'm going to go back to that civilian thing. And he's, he says, well, how would you like to be uh, the speechwriter for the sink? <laughs> and I, I'm a lieutenant now. And I said, well, that would be fun, but... I'm signing my DD-214 after I meet with you. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm going to be a civilian. Like, there are no orders. I don't think even you can work that fast. If Not even the Admiral Reason can make that happen that fast. Okay. Um, he goes, well, okay, fine. But you're interested. I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? That sounds like fun. You know, this... I was just rolling with it. I've always, because I was schooled by my mentors, take it a job at a time. And I had no family responsibilities. And I knew my boss. I knew Captain Carmen. I knew Admiral Reason. I knew the EA. It was a fantastic team at the time. Sounded like fun. And like something I could do and still kind of work on my dissertation proposal. I said, yeah, sure. Um, yes, I'm interested. He goes, well, when can you start? I said, well, Captain, I mean, <laughs> I need to work on my proposal. How about, how about October? He goes, how about August? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, August. <laughs> and that's how it happened. You know, then, then that year they turned it into a year of active duty for special work, which they made into another year of ADSW. And then Admiral Reason retired um, out of that job. Admiral Clark relieved him. Admiral Clark kept me there. I didn't know Admiral Clark, but he kept me uh, after trying me out, I guess. So they renewed me again. And then one day, he's, I knew he was confirmed to be the next CNO after Admiral Jay Johnson. And... Admiral Clark had me in his office. We were talking about a speech, and then we stopped, and he says, how do you like Washington, D.C.? And I lied through my teeth and said I liked it. <laughs> so there I was, July 2000. I'm the CNO speechwriter. I'm a lieutenant commander. and You can't make that stuff up. Sir, July of 2000, that means that you would have been at the Pentagon September 11th, 2001? I was there on 9-11, yeah. Yeah. That was insane. The whole, and leading up to it was kind of insane. It's easy, 9-11 eclipses the stuff that happened before, but, um, you know, before that, we had the EP3 incident uh, where the, that EP3 was forced down. Um, Sir, I'm not familiar with that. Could you... Oh, my goodness. Uh, I'll just tell you, Google it. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> I think it Hainan or Hai, I think it's Hainan. EP3, a forced downing of the EP3 onto Chinese territory. Not exactly a, a glorious moment. Um, yeah, look that up. I'm surprised you don't know about it, frankly. There's a gap in your education right there. I'm not, this is not the time to fill it. Uh, but the one you, I'm sure you will remember was also then uh, um, the near sinking of the USS Cole. Yes, sir. I'll never forget that. And, you know, we've got Commander Lippold here, right? Isn't he, wasn't he teaching an LEL? He may be, sir. I know he spoke to our plebe summer class, at least. Okay. He's closely affiliated. Yeah. So um, the PAO I was working with at the time now retired Admiral Frank Thorpe and uh, and Commander Lippel were pretty close, so uh, you know I I got a I got a lot of 
firsthand reports from or secondhand through Admiral Thorpe. So we had that, right? Um, and then 9-11 happened, yeah. Think about it every 9-11. Sir, do you mind telling us a little bit about what hap- what the day was like for you? Oh, I, I still, rem- yeah. I mean, it was, I, I think a lot of people will relate this. I, you know, so my, my, I was a newlywed. My wife, Melissa, was working in uh, D.C. And we were living in Crystal City. One reason for that was the commute for me. I, you know, I didn't have to worry about driving in and parking, you know, Having interned there, you know how much fun parking is. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't figure lieutenant commander, even on the CNO staff, was going to get any parking. Um, and I didn't want to sit in traffic from, you know, Dumfries or Alexandria. So I just we took an apartment in Crystal City and walked, sometimes rode my bike. Weather was awesome. It was just a perfect late summer day. It was fantastic. Um, I was in my office, and then I heard then Commander Thorpe go, "Hey, John, get in here!" You know, like he always had his TV on to one of the other news channels, and there's the World Trade Center. You know, it's on fire. It's like, hey, a plane hit the building. I'm like, holy cow! You know, and so we're just watching the building and catching up on the to do list, and then we saw the second plane hit, and then and then we knew immediately, okay, right, something serious is happening. And this is not an accident. So at about that time, it hit. It's like this would be a great time to have a coffee break, you know. So we went to the coffee bar at the one of the apexes in the inner Pentagon, a quarter a ring. And I remember having my coffee donut recently acquired, and that's when the plane hit the Pentagon. Um. Just uh, sounded like an enormous metallic door slamming shut. Um, none of that Hollywood explosion stuff. Just a very loud bam. And we felt it, but I wasn't knocked to my feet. I, I mean, this that's a massive building. They built it right. Um, f- we definitely felt it, but um, we then we stepped into the corridor to make sure, sh- you know, we we're like, wow, that was close. And... But we knew, we knew what happened. Um, and we looked down the corridor and saw our office mates, and we knew ex- all of them made it out. And they were fine. And oddly enough, we were, I think, the only remaining occupied office on our corridor because all our neighboring offices had been in um, emptied because they were in the middle of a renovation and had relocated a lot of the staff in our section. So we knew there was no one else in our corridor because the ones who came out said, yeah, there's no one else there. And there was this barrier, a stairwell thing that served as a blast barrier for our folks. So, you know, we, we exited. You know, the next thing we know, we had security with drawn weapons and directing us out. No, what I also remember is uh, weird what you remember. I remember thinking at one point, well, this is stupid, because I, I was just, we were all walking. That was, that was one memory. We're all walking. No one was panicking or running. We're just walking. We're all wondering where the next plane is going to hit the Pentagon. We're like, of course two planes are coming here. It's huge. The other one was I was spent... I don't know how long I walked with them, but I was walking along still with my donut and my coffee in my hand. I'm like, well, well this is stupid, right? So <laughs> I threw them in the nearest trash can and, you know, walked out with everyone. Uh, some of us made uh, our way out. I remember we, uh, we piled into Frank Thorpe's car. He dropped us off at my apartment building, a, a bunch of us, uh, and then he dashed off to go get his kids from school. The people I had with us, we met, we went up to my apartment, and I forget all who all I had. I th- think there were six of us. And back then, you know, no smartphones. Cell phones were still fairly new. It was all cell phones and Blackberries. 
So when you, when you're trying to make a call, we just saturated the system. All the you know it was just crazy. Landlines mobbed. Eventually, I burned through. Um, you know, because what do you do? You muster. I couldn't reach my wife. Next thing was muster. Couldn't reach anyone on the staff. Finally reached Mrs. Clark. And I said, ma'am, it's John. Um, have you heard from the boss? Yes, I have. He, the EA, whoever else is with him, they're all fine. They weren't near. Like, okay, um, I'm fine. This is who I have. I guess you're the de facto mustering petty officer. <laughs> She was cool as a cucumber, just really cool and professional. Um, and I said, okay, that's who we have. You know, ran down a list, this name, that phone number. Uh, they're with me. They may take off soon to go connect with their families, you know. Eventually reached my bride, who all that she'd heard was the Navy section of the Pentagon was hit, and so all she, she didn't know. But for a while... Is pretty bad for her because she just thought she was a widow within her first year of marriage. I knew in a, you know, nanosecond I'm okay, but for a long while she didn't know anything about what happened to me. Yeah, and that building burned. I mean, that Crystal City was like a New England fog of smoke and was just enveloping us, and it's it smelled like burning building. Yeah. You know, and we didn't know anything about who we lost um, um, until a few days later. At least I didn't, didn't I that found out that it hit the command center, you know, that we'd lost some people. But no one I personally knew, but yeah. Sir, what are your reflections on the whole about working in the Pentagon? Did you enjoy the experience? What did no. you learn from it? <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed it in the sense that it was very professionally satisfying. I had a, I had a great boss in Admiral Clark, but the rest of the team around him was really, they, man, they were great. It, really professionally great as you would expect CNO's team to be, but also just we meshed really well as a team. Um, the aides, I got on with the aides. We all got on together. We covered for each other, not like, you know, covering for each other like tap and go or something, but, right, right. you know, we just filled in. We helped each other out. Didn't need to be told what to do in, to that end. Uh, we knew what our jobs were for and what we were about, and it was all about, you know, supporting the boss um, and his agenda. Um, I learned a great deal from him because of the access he granted me, um, not only to him, but to, to the rest of the shop. It, you know, Admiral Clark basically put the word out that my speechwriter can uh, – can go anywhere he wants to. I, I made use of the privilege very carefully, believe me. But, you know, I learned how to work with other flag officers, other senior officers. I mean, I'm, you're still an 04 in the Pentagon. You're surrounded by elephants. I, I learned how to tread carefully. But um, I learned a lot about how headquarters works. I learned a lot about bureaucracy. I learned about how hard it is to get that bureaucracy moving in one direction to a common goal. I mean, being the CNO, that is not an easy job. I saw how doggone hard he worked and the vice chief, you know, the, I saw how the admirals earned their paychecks. And I'm like, yeah, they're not golfing every day, you know? Um, and even they had to answer for, you know, how many meetings did I not get into or had to wait hours to, to finally get the meeting I had booked a week ago because Secretary Rumsfeld, you know, just dropped a meeting on, on all of the service chiefs. <laughs> like, okay, they work for somebody. <laughs> <laughs> and you learn, okay, that's how this rolls too. So um, I, 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 I learned a great deal 
about leadership at that level and um, how much collaboration you had to do, um, how flag assignment works. Man, he taught, you know, stuff I can't even talk about even today because it's sensitive, not because it's classified, but he swore us to silence and Admiral Clark, just one plane ride, was telling us what he was thinking about in terms of, uh, you know, putting which admiral where, and, you know, he's thinking out loud, and he must have had some good wine on the flight, you know. And we were all looking at each other like, wow, whoa. And he's like, and you can't say anything. And we're like, you know, no boss. <laughs> <laughs> to this day, I've said nothing. Never will. Sir, I'm fascinated by uh, speech writing as a, as a challenge and as a job. I think about some of the famous presidential speechwriters like Peggy Noonan and, and people like that. Did you look to anybody like a Peggy Noonan for inspiration in speech writing, or is that just a completely different, is writing political speeches completely different than writing speeches for a CNO? And also, how did you um, write the speeches? Did, did the way that you wrote for Admiral Reason change from the way that you wrote from Admiral Clark? Oh, absolutely. Both very different men with very different voices, both with... Uh, a clear sense of themselves and their purpose, that was awesome to have, you know, that uh, I wasn't playing a guessing game on what they, what they thought about something. I, I knew what they thought about something, and I was privileged to know it because they shared it with me. Um, not every principal that ha makes speeches knows what they're about. That was an illuminating lesson for me. Um, interesting you mentioned Peggy Noon, and she was a great example to me. I didn't follow her style or anything like that, but I did read not so much what she, the speeches she wrote for President Reagan, and I know he had a hand in them too, um, but just how to go about doing it. Um, I, I, I read great speeches. I read about being a speech writer, but then I eventually realized that they weren't really helping me a ton when I was writing for um, Admirals Clark and Reason. What helped me most there was my access to them and their willingness to be candid with me and open about what they were thinking on a certain subject and what they wanted to say and sometimes how they wanted to say it. But they reposed in me an amazing trust in my ability to do it, in my judgment to uh, make it their speech and not mine. Admiral Clark asked me about it one time. He says, you know, do you, does it ever irritate you that you're writing this and, uh, you know, I get credit for what you write? And I'm like, well, once you open your mouth, sir, it's your speech. <laughs> You have the harder job. I, mean, I have to please you. You have to please all these people, you know. Um, so we understood each other and we understood, you know, how the relationship worked. So my job was to write something they could use in their voice, their idiom, that captured what they wanted to say and understand their, I had, you know, I had to brief the audience. That was the part of it, right? Who's the audience? Who's going to be in it? What do they think is important? What, um, so a, a lot of research had to go into that, too. Did you have a staff, or were you the sole speech I writer? did not have a staff. I was it. That came as a surprise to all of my uh, counterparts who worked for the other service chiefs. came as a surprise to me to find out that the secretary, the, uh, no, excuse me, that the chairman of the Joint Chiefs had 206s, uh, heading or co-heading that shop and a number of officers, you know, doing their speeches. Now, I mean, the chairman had a lot more speaking than the CNO, but um, almost every other service chief had a team. I was it. I mean, I had occasionally, I had assistance from um, Lieutenant Commander Rafter, uh, from Commander Bill Calais, who was a uh, class of 80 here. Um, but usually I was flying solo, yeah. So moving ahead in your uh, timeline, did you go back to 
working towards earning your PhD after leaving the speech writing role, or how did oh, that Oh, yeah. Work? Well, okay. I landed this job. I mean, then, right. then PMP came open, and, you know, you got, again, mentors. You know, the, the EA at the time that uh, the PMP program, it was a program back then. We weren't a community with a designator. Um then captain and you know re now retired rear admiral dave gove who was the ea said hey have you seen this you'd be great at this you know and um then commander dale kid lume class of 80 said oh yeah yeah you should go for that go do that you know so with their support i apply I, you wrote, how did you get into this job? And like, it's kind of like what Kayla Barron says about being an astronaut, you know? The, the... Soup Carter said, you know, you, you apply. <laughs> <laughs> so I applied, you know? There was a nav admin with, here's how to apply, and here's where you send your application. And, you know, I figured, well, that sounds like a kind of a cool way to finish my doctorate and, and then use it. And I, my endorsement chain's not going to get any better than this. I mean, you know, Admiral Clark's my endorsing officer, right? right? So, yeah, that's how that's that's how that road started, you know. Sir, did you was that a big decision point for you at that time to to almost ensure that you were not going to be following the traditional naval career path and move towards something that's more of a niche role? Was that a tough decision at the time, or did you? To be a PMP? Yes, sir. I'm going to tell you something Admiral Clark told me or, and would tell other audiences regarding his career path, which was also unconventional. He was commissioned out of OCS. He had broken service as well. It's not something he liked to just kind of advertise, but he, he would be honest about it. it. He just didn't lead with it. He goes, you know, I always felt that my career was walking through open doors. And, and this door opened. And I walked through it. <laughs> because I had mentors who, who, who suggested it to me, supported me in doing it, suggested that this would be kind of an interesting way for you to be a, you know, an academic geek and do that teaching thing and still be in uniform. And I, you know, read through it and I thought, yeah, you know, this sounds like a cool gig. Um, and it was a program. So, you know, it was a risk. You know, the thing about a program is it's easy to kill. Um, talked over it with my uh, bride and, you know, she says, yeah, let's yeah, go for it. Because otherwise I, I was probably going to quit the doctoral program thing because now I'm married and I have – I now wiser to the fact that assistant professors of religion or history don't earn a lot of money, you know, especially not where we were living in Alexandria. So it was either that or I was just going to leave academe entirely and just be ABD and find some other gig, you know. That was an inflection point, a big one for, for me and my family, yeah. Sir, so in terms of the history of this department here, at the Naval Academy. Is there anyone that stands out to you as having an impact on you when you arrived at the history department in terms of a mentor role or anything like that? I will, when I first got here, so I'm talking my first couple of years here, the people who decisively impacted me in terms of, because I was a stranger to the Naval Academy. So, hey man, here's how this works kind of thing. And here's how to think about how you fit in and all that. So uh, Prof. Craig Simons was definitely one of them. He was not the chair anymore. I'm a brand new thing in the history department, permanent mill prof, the second one of them, close on the heels of now retired Captain C.C. Felker, who eventually became chair of the department before he retired. But so... If, Felker, class of 81, shipmate, but also mentor, you know, several years senior to me. And, and um, I guess you could say we could have been competitors, but I, I never got that vibe from him. But, you know, 
CC took me under his wing and kind of said, hey, knucklehead, you know, when I was acting like a knucklehead as a commander knucklehead. And it's one of his favorite words, by the way. And yes, CC, I hope you hear this. Um, yeah, so CC kind of said, hey, you know, he, he would regularly tell me, hey, you know, this is the Naval Academy. It's this is kind of how we do stuff around here. And, you know, not like that to do it this way. Or so, and I got acquainted with Prof. Simons because Prof. Peeler, who was the chair at the time, so Peeler's this other huge impact guy. Peeler wanted to keep my collateral duties low, but he put me on an external review committee um, under uh, uh, Prof. Simons to work on an aspect of our self-assessment, which had to do with collateral duties and service in the department. But, you know, Craig was, Simons was really, really good with me and just kind of took me under his wing. It's like, hey, you know, this is how this works in this department. This is what we do. And you know, go out and learn this stuff and, you know, would task me and then kind of help me shape what I was writing and, and uh, taught me a lot in the process. He didn't view me as some kind of weird leper, you know, who was, what's a PMP? What's that? You know, um, he really brought me into the team. And so did Peeler and, and um, Felker, you know, and I, that's when I realized that I could have a stake here and actually contribute and actually be a teacher here. And um, again, it came down to trust. And they trusted that I would start carrying my weight and would come up to speed. And um, it wasn't easy, but they made it, they made it a heck of a lot less crazy challenging. Yeah. And my kids were starting to come along. <laughs> you know, so that was a crazy time. Yeah. So what were your first impressions of the, of the brigade? of midshipmen my first impression was that the brigade is a weird animal and that impression has never changed <laughs> i say that now more with affection than uh mystification um and an, and an appreciation for its weirdness uh, i think probably the thing that struck me that i didn't fully appreciate as a as a prof and really had to wrap my heads around head around was how time starved uh midshipmen are um, how regimented the life is, how much downtime y'all don't have. Uh, frankly, it's a, a, something that I've n never liked about this place, that your education here lacks what I think is sufficient soak time. Um, you, you don't get a lot of time here to just think, almost like they don't trust you to have any of that kind of time we better fill it because idle hands are the devil's playground right and who knows what deviltry midshipman warren emmy is going to get up to if i don't prescribe some time um i understand the pressures i i have come now this side of 18 years here to understand why that is we got to get you done in 47 months that doesn't leave a lot of time for you to find yourself or to just process all the stuff that's thrown at you, you know, in the classroom and on the training side and all that stuff. I understand why it is. That doesn't make me like it anymore uh, or it doesn't make me dislike it less. I've learned, I adapt, I certainly adapted my teaching to it. And you saw it this semester, frankly, Nels, especially when I got a lot busier. And I was just talking to the librarians yesterday about this because, you know, the librarians want to be want to serve the brigade and take their jobs very seriously. And, and, and they, too, were talking with us, with me um, and amongst themselves about how how do we serve the mids? You know, they're so busy. They're so time crunched. How do we get them to the library? How do we get them to just wander the stacks? How do we? Uh, get them to come here and talk to us and, you know, how do we give them, how do we impart curiosity on them to do their research or to learn about search? You, you know, that's kind of the stuff we were talking about yesterday. And they too remark upon this, how cramped midshipmen seem to be for time. And it's not simply because they, like every other undergraduate in America, are master procrastinators. <laughs> I mean, this isn't all on mids, okay? A lot of it is being an undergrad. 
So I, I hope mids don't think that sometimes I'm picking on them when I tease them. I'm like, I'm just picking on young people, you know, so. But sir, I think that there's a sense that midshipmen should have a bit of a higher standard than the rest of undergrads, which I think is why it's easy to say, well, this is what we thought midshipmen were going to be like getting ahead on papers and actually being curious about it. But then in reality, it's not all that different at times from the rest of undergrads. Well, so I think you're right, Nels. I mean, I mean and you all came here for that, I think. I mean, I know, I know it, it's grounds for a lot of complaint, you know, uh, IHTFP and all that stuff. And I don't know if you're going to blank that out of this, but um, you, you want to be held to a higher standard. I mean, really, mids, mids won't respect you if you don't hold them to a higher standard. They'll grouse about it, but they want you to hold them there. So I've never lowered my standards just because I understand midshipmen are, are time-starved, you know. Um, but I hope I've helped midshipmen over the years deal with the fact, with that particular fact of their existence here. You know, like, I'm fond of telling mids, right, look, all of you are smart enough to get through this place. The admissions office does a, a good job. I've really only met one midshipman in 18 years here that I thought the admissions office got wrong on in terms of intellectual capacity. To me, the rest comes down to discipline and desire, honestly. Like, okay, fine, you're busy, I get it. But I also know, guys, this far in, you all managed to waste a lot of time anyway. <laughs> and, and post it on Instagram. That's stupid, but you know, okay. <laughs> so mattress jousting, you know, I, I get it. You're undergrads, you know, you're gonna waste time. Maybe you should waste less of it. Maybe you should get up earlier. How about carving out sleep time? Now I know the push is on, midshipmen need more rest and all that. And there's that constant tension, you know, like we are gonna restructure the day to afford you more opportunities for rest. I'm like, okay. I get it, but also it's more opportunity for many of them to just waste more time, you know? Like, are you getting the rest? Are they actually getting the rest? I don't think so. Um, but some mids get it, right? Some mids carve out the time, and I pay attention to what they do. They get into the class, and what do they do? Now, some are on their devices playing a game, Snapchatting, I don't know, wasting time. Believe me, students since the dawn of time have found ways to waste time. I can show you primary sources on this from ancient Rome through the Middle Ages. Midshipmen students, they're going to goof off and waste time. We haven't needed smartphones to do that. But I think what mids have to learn is how to use their time wisely. So the, the ones who get it make use of all the inter interstitial time, I call it. The 10 minutes here, you know, uh, the half hour that just fell into their lap because a training evolution was canceled. You know, okay, have you made flashcards? Have you stuck it in your pocket? Are you pulling them out now? Do you just go through them? Uh, whatever it is, I don't know, you know Chinese vocabulary or what is, the, what is a mole? This Avogadro is constant. I don't Whatever it is. Are you, are you on? Are you maximally using the little time that, you have, that the chain of command is left to you to use? Now that, that is a great pro professional lesson because you know what? You don't get a lot of soak time in the fleet. The work is never done. And I mean, it's just never done. Never go to your boss and say, I'm done for the day. I'm going home. Like, uh, that's almost daring your boss to find stuff for you to do. <laughs> Bill Crow, Bill, he, he trained me out of that real fast. I'm just like, um, I want to go home. <laughs> I never told him my list was done because it never was. And one of the other things that's so hard to do is for anybody, I'm not just saying the brigade here, and, and this goes back to my conversation with the librarians. I mean, it is so hard to impart as a teacher. It is so hard to impart curiosity. How do you teach someone to be curious? I haven't cracked that nut yet. I mean, I've tried to show them what it's like. I've tried to do that in class by being passionate about what I'm teaching. And I never had to fake it because I am passionate about what I teach. I think the stuff I'm sharing is kind of cool and infinitely and endlessly fascinating. You know, and I hope by showing, reading this document or that, like trying to show midshipmen, like, 
you know, what we're reading here is really kind of weird. Like, why would it be this way? Why did people act this way? Because it's not obvious that they would act this way. Would you do this? You know, um, it's hard as a parent to, you, you kind of try to share as much of the world and whatnot to, sh to show you, your kids, your students, how much cool stuff there is out there. And, you know, try to, try to get them to be curious, you know, get the hell out of that screen. I would say screens are the enemy of curiosity, you know, for one thing. Um, the other thing that's awfully hard to teach is initiative, which goes in with, you know, getting your work done. I'm like, one of the things I constantly worry about midshipmen, and it is a worry, because uh, I, I also think about it as a parent, is imparting a sense of just do it. Use your initiative. Don't wait for me to tell you to do something. You know what your job is. Go do it. It's not that hard. <laughs> and the best junior officers I've ever worked with, the best officers I've ever worked with, the best enlisted I've ever worked with, have not had to be told what to do. Or maybe they've had to be told what to do, but I've, I don't tell them how to do it. I offer advice telling them, I'm here if you want advice. As I teach, it's kind of like I, I'm low on the how. I try not to be too highly prescriptive. But then the really, really good sailors and officers are just, they, they know what they have to do. So they give themselves their jobs. I'll work on this qual. No one told me to work on the qual. I'll just start working on it. And I'm not going to go on liberty right now. Everyone else is crossing the brow. I think I'll wait a couple hours and then, then go on liberty. Then I'll hit the beach after I've crawled the system for the hundredth time to qualify EAL. Or, you know, there's this thing that I've noticed the boss always gripes about. I'm going to go fix that thing. And I'm not even going to brag that I fixed that thing because he's right. That area looks like crap and it just needs to be fixed up. And, and the boss griping about it makes everybody's life miserable. So I'm just going to take care of it. little stuff. I'm not even talking about big stuff. Just, you know, people see stuff to do and then they go do it. <laughs> so hard to teach that. I don't, except by modeling it. I, I, I really haven't cracked that. And I don't know how you do it except by example. And then when you see it, to reward it. I do it with my kids. I praise them for taking initiative. Hey, dude, I see that you got up with my son. Hey, what are you doing up? I set my alarm. Why are you up? I wanted to make myself breakfast. I'm like, yes! <laughs> Those are good days. <laughs> I'd like to ask a little bit about the class that you taught, History of Christianity. Yeah. Why do you think that's important for the development of future naval officers, and what lessons did you try to impart to midshipmen through oh. your course material? Wow. Well, History of Christianity is just what I, what I love teaching, and what I, what I love studying. It's what I fell into. Um, I'm not sure that knowing the history of Christianity as such as a subject area is vital to an officer's development. Um, um, to me, that kind of claim is preposterous. Um, do I think learning the history of Christianity contributes to the breadth of your education here? Absolutely. I've tried to teach it that way. Um, I mean, it is the religious tradition that has dominated the history of the West down to the present. It still shapes it, secularists notwithstanding. It has a deep legacy that still has an impact and an influence. And, you know, the more you know about Christianity, the more you will understand where all that stuff comes from, why this or that thing comes from in the, in the West, even though it may have been secularized. You know, and then as you know, as I've taught it, then I point to its Jewish origins. You know, I don't try, I don't try to make it a, a blended noun, Judeo-Christianity. I'm like, that does a disservice to Jews, I think. You know, I try to just say, what, 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 what slide do I start with? 
uh, Christ was a Jew. Yeah, G- and, Jesus was a Jew, right? Christ is a claim. <laughs> um, that that's what I my aim there. But I could also point you to the history of Islam, taught by you, you know uh, Professor Wheeler. Um, history of Judaism. I think he's also taught that, right? I think Professor Belenoid or or Captain McCreese also taught history of Islam. I think it's important, frankly, to learn about the history of some religion to appreciate the religious dimension in society despite the growing secularization of secularization of the modern world. One of the things that stymies many people is in recent years the pushback against secularization in the world. In some areas, right, arguably, at least in intent, some areas of the world have become more religious or are trying to be. I understand that may be imposed, but nonetheless, it's a reaction against certain modernist tendencies. So I think it's as a matter of a good, well-rounded education, it's important to learn about a religious tradition. You know, if you didn't take history of Christianity, I'd recommend you take history of religion or history of Islam or Judaism, you know, or Buddhism. I think Dr., uh, I think Professor Ruth has done um, Buddhism before. Yeah. Uh, So that's the longish answer to your question. Sir, grading, would you like to tell us about any of your opinions about grading and examinations, testing? The longer I've taught, the more jaundiced an an eye I cast toward grades. I know I shared with you that that bit from Father James Shawl, who was a Jesuit that taught at Georgetown. And he relates in one of his books... um, I think it's a, another sort of learning. He asks his student what a grade is, and the student replies to him. It's not him that's saying it. The student replied to him, a grade is a measure of the student's insecurity, <laughs> which I was always amused by. And there's it, part of, it, it rings true, right, to, to a certain extent. I was a grade freak. I, 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 you know, I'm a geek. I mean, I used to obsess about grades. Do I think grades are a a reliably measure how much learning has gone on? No, I don't. No, I don't. I've met midshipmen who are A students, really smart, wicked smart, who haven't learned very much. They're just really good on tests. They know how to pump and dump. They know how to cram. Um, but as one of them related to me after killing it on a calculus exam, the way he put it to me, he's like, I'm still not sure how much calculus I really understand. I'm like, Well, that's revealing and kind of damning. <laughs> so, And I've met midshipmen who work really hard for that C plus and B minus who I think have learned more. So can we say that the A person has learned more than the C person? Not always. There are times when I know that person who's really tried and still just couldn't get it to B range, but from where they were at the beginning of the semester, and how much effort they've put into the class and uh, the attention they brought to the material, man, they've learned a lot about themselves, about their work habits, um, about taking notes. And I'm like, yeah, that person, they've learned. The delta, if we measure learning by the delta, what was, bef- what, what, you know, beginning and now at the end, what's gone on? Sometimes they have the greatest delta. Still can't give them a B, though, because of this or that exam or whatever. But are they a better writer now, better reader? You know, sometimes, yeah, they are. 
or they are more aware of their deficiencies and are now better equipped to address them. So who's learned more? Sir, looking back at your time as a PMP, what do you look back, or more broadly, during your time as a naval officer, what do you look back on with the most pride? I'm not even sure I can answer that yet. I'm mulling over stuff like that. You know, I'm the most pride. Well, I think my time here, I think, I know, I know that I've had a mostly positive impact on a lot of folks who are junior and now senior officers, and some, frankly, who are, who now no longer are, but are uh, decided to, you know, enter civilian life for their own reasons and more power to them. I mean, not everybody can make this a 30-year career. You know, the, the, the officer corps is not big enough for that. Um, but yeah, I'm proud of my, I'm most probably most proud of my contribution to the service and the country through doing what I've done here. Um, I know I've touched a lot of lives because the people whose lives I've touched have told me that, and their parents have, and in some cases their children have. Like, wow, okay. Um, not everybody gets to know that. So that's also a blessing as well to know that. And I'm at peace with it. That's why I had so much fun this semester with you guys. Because I felt like this is a great way to go out. <laughs> this is a great semester. And I lucked out with all three sections that I had. It's just very few times you draw that kind of hand. But, you know, three of a kind, man. I'll, that works for me. Um, Yeah, I'll miss that part. It's time for a new thing, but I'll, I'll miss that part. But I know I'll be in touch with it still. I'm still in touch with former students. I just was talking with a class of 21 grad uh, who's in Japan. We had a, a long talk by phone about what's going on on the deck plates with her. Um, I'm going to uh, pin Commander's Oak Leaves onto one of the first mids I ever taught, Rebecca Islin, who's now uh, in an EDO and has asked me if I'll pin her. Um, that's a good reason to get out, you know, before she makes captain, for God's sake. So um, she's, we're going to promote her on the USS Alabama down, you know, that'll be fun. Um, looking up at the space station as it's going by, standing, you know, outside at night with her husband watching Kayla fly overhead in the space station with my kids, that's pretty cool. You know, getting uh, emails from a mid who's like, you know, my career just went sideways, what do I do now? I really need some advice. Um, I've had, I've lost track of how many times I've had those conversations from the fleet. I, and I treasure those, you know. Um, yeah, it's been a it's been a great eighteen years here. Thank you very much, sir, for agreeing to talk with me today. Absolutely. Thanks, great Nels. Conversation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs>